Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to the Red Alts Podcast, the podcast that highlights the stories of people who said fuck that for the idea that growing up means giving up on your dreams and instead turn those dreams into their reality. Today's guest is the acclaimed Australian photographer and filmographer, Michelle Grace Under. We're here today with Michelle Grace Hunter. Michelle, welcome to Red Alts. Who are you? What do you do? Hi, guys. Um, yes, my name is Michelle Grace Hunter. I guess I'm known as a music photographer. That's kind of what I'm best known for. But I also am a radio host and a new producer of a film as well. A new producer? <laughs> as, yeah, because I guess previous to this, I wasn't a producer and now I've just produced a film. So... New. <laughs> <laughs> now, you started your career around eight years ago, uh, photographing the Aussie hip-hop scene. Mm-hmm. Um, what was it about that scene that inspired you to start snapping? That's a good question. So, basically, I've kind of been involved in hip-hop and hip-hop culture since I was about 12 years old. And I was very ignorant to the Australian scene and um, a lot of the music that was being made here uh, but one of my friends um, from my hometown in Shepparton, um, his name's Briggs, and he's uh, an incredible hip hop artist. So I hadn't seen him for quite a few years, and we caught up, and he's mentioned that he's now a rapper, and I was like, "What? <laughs> You're a rapper? Okay, sure." <laughs> and he sent me through a bunch of stuff, and I was literally blown away. I was like, "This is amazing!" and it kind of sparked, I guess, an interest in finding out what other hip hop that was being made in Australia. And it really opened my eyes to this really incredible scene that was like, I guess, bigger than the stuff that I was aware of that I'd kind of heard maybe on Triple J or whatever. Um, There's this whole really amazing, incredible scene of amazing stuff being made here. So that really sparked a bit of an interest on, I guess, me starting to document the scene and yeah, take photos at gigs and yeah, I guess it started that way. It started slowly. <laughs> did you find it that it was difficult to embed yourself in that scene or did it sort of flow naturally and happen? It was incredibly, not easy, that's the wrong word. I was very welcomed. I was wel- welcomed with open arms. I felt like immediately I found my people and it was really interesting for me because I didn't pick up a camera till I was 31, so I was quite old and... Um, this was a, a very new scene to me. I started going along to gigs. I didn't know anybody and I just made friends really easily. And, um, yeah, I guess it just, yeah, the, the progression happened very naturally and very organically. Um, and then the decision was made to, um, do portraits of a lot of the artists in the scene as a way really to get myself known and, and, um, cement myself as a music photographer, and that process happened really organically as well. I just started doing that and then I would be put onto somebody else and um, eventually that became a book, which was my first like self-published thing that happened. Yeah. And that book was called Rise. It was, uh, that book was called Rise, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, how many portraits are in the, in the book? Um, I can't remember how many actual portraits. I know there's 182 artists, but some of them are groups. So um, maybe like 150 portraits or something. I'd have to go through and count all the pages. But yeah, there's a lot. When you were putting it together, did you sit there going, wow, I didn't even realise I'd taken this many photographs or... No, it was more... Actually, it it was kind of the opposite. It was like once I started it was almost like there was no end and like I actually had to draw a line in the sand to say because I could just I mean I could still be shooting there's just so many artists and they're popping up every day um it was really about okay I've got a this needs to be the stop or the end I guess of the project right now um because yeah otherwise we'll be continuing for the next 10 years so once I got I think the last shoot for that project was the Hilltop Hoods and once I got them I was like okay I feel like this is like a definitive collection of Australian hip hop as of this date, um, which was in 2014. And now it's like, God, it's completely moved from there. It's like- Need a whole nother book. A whole nother book, yes, yeah, totally. Was it a case of getting lucky to an extent in that the scene was on the rise at the same time as your career was getting underway, do you think? Totally, like uh, this really weird synergy in what was happening with Australian hip hop at the time. I guess me noticing that, um, and going, wow, there's something really interesting bubbling away here and I want to be the person that documents it. Um, and also there not being a lot of photographers at that stage that were really focused on Australian hip-hop. There was only really a couple around the country that were 
and a, a couple of them were based in Sydney, not that many here. So, yeah, I mean, to total um, luck, I guess you could call that. <laughs> Fortune. <laughs> going off script a little here yeah um, I'm particularly interested in the fact that you grew up around the Shepparton area and yes so um, country girl <laughs> yeah, so how does a person from Shepparton end up being a photographer who's internationally acclaimed <laughs> and renowned <laughs> uh, how, how is that a process like a lot of people would say oh you're born in a country town yeah. you're probably gonna live a country town life you're probably totally. gonna die in the country town how yeah. did you make that not your reality god that's such a good question I guess I'm parents of two Italian migrants that came here in the 50s you know they didn't speak the best English for a lot a lot of the time I had a pretty rough here like in terms of just racism and stuff that happened um, in the 50s and 60s and 70s obviously it's really different now for Italians but back in the day it was it was pretty tough um, and I think that they instilled a real resilience in me in terms of wanting a better life. So, like, they worked so hard to provide my brother and I every opportunity possible, really. Um, my mum really wanted me to go to university. She wasn't allowed to go to university, so she really wanted that for me, I guess. So, I guess my... I always wanted to move to Melbourne. It was, like, from the age I was 12 years old, I was like, OK, I'm moving to Melbourne. I knew that my life was bigger than a country town. Um, I don't know where that really came from, but I just felt it in me. It was just like, I'm destined for something greater. Yeah, and then, like, the path for me was really abstract, I guess, because I did a sports science degree and I ended up working in sport for a long time. And, um, yeah, I've, I've worked in many kind of different careers before I actually picked up a camera, but I've always, I don't know, I've had this feeling in myself that I've wanted to have a life that was... I guess off the beaten track a little bit I don't know I don't I can't really explain it but there's something in me that was like I don't want to lead a normal life I want my life to be interesting and fun and every day different and that's kind of what I strive to create for myself since you've released Rise in 2014 since then you've sort of branched out doing other sort of genres of music and even yep. going into like fashion and taking all those sort of shots what it's like inspired the change or like you know like to branch out and try yeah. other things the big inspiration was actually coming to the end of rise and like looking at my folio and going wow i've shot so many men and like not <laughs> even like it was such an unconscious thing at the time because that was the Australian hip hop scene, obviously, and I'm really comfortable working with men. I had never even, it hadn't even crossed my mind that it was really a thing. But I'm like, wow, like, okay, I spent two years documenting Australian hip hop and I could only find about 10 women that were actively recording and touring at the time. And I was just like, okay, this is weird. What's going on here? Um, and then I started doing research just about the whole industry and different genres and, and I'm like wow this is actually not just in Australian hip-hop this is actually across all genres and some are worse than others and it's behind the scenes and I kind of wanted to explore why that was and so my next project I knew that I wanted to work with women and I wanted to change I wanted to do a project that sh shone a light on all the incredible women that were making music in Australia. So that's really where the idea came for Her Sound, Her Story. And originally, I didn't really know what that was going to be. It was going Originally, it was going to be a portrait series, and it was going to be about 10 women. Um, and then that turned into an incredible four-year project and a documentary and a, a collaboration with an incredible filmmaker, Claudia. Um, that has like completely changed my life so <laughs> I mean I come from a punk and hardcore background I don't know too much about Australian hip-hop outside of what Triple J plays I've found that over the last couple of years bands that feature female musicians and vocalists are becoming more prominent in the punk and hardcore scene and in metal even is that the same with Australian hip-hop is it on yeah the rise totally to like in definitely in the last four years I've started to see a huge surge in women um that are making australian hip-hop and also just across all the genres now that i'm kind of aware of what everyone's doing it's like it's really interesting it's um there's really something to be said specifically for women about seeing other women do something before you believe you can do it and that's why that visibility thing is really important like a, lo a, a lot of the argument is about you know it's about merit and you just got to put the best people on there and that's that is true there's also something to be said about opportunity for 
a future generation of women to come through and be like, actually, it is possible to, for me to be on the main stage as well. So there's kind of arguments in both of those views. Yeah, I think it would be difficult in, let's say, like a group setting that to show, like, for instance, the merit of the individual, but also make sure that it's not sort of labelled as, like, tokenism. Totally, and I think a lot of women struggle with that as well. It's like we don't want to be token. There's a lot of women that have been actually participating for a long time and just felt like they didn't have those opportunities. I do feel like that is changing now, and it's amazing to see... Um, and that's really just going to spark a new generation of women that to see that it's possible. And then hopefully we don't have to have the merit conversation at all. It's just like, holy shit, those women are kick ass and they deserve to be there, you know? It's it's really interesting because I was watching her sound her story, which we will get back to in a moment to mm -hmm. have a more in-depth conversation about. Uh, as a mu music fan, as a musician myself, I never actually considered the gender of the person whom I was listening to. Mm -hmm. It's never been an element of whether I chose to listen to a band or not, or whether yep. I chose to listen to an MC or not, or whether I chose to listen to a person's opinions or not. Totally. Um, it, it's never occurred to me. But from having watching that documentary, but also having uh, engaged with other people within the scenes I grew up in, it occurred to me that it really was a sticking point for a lot of other people. Yeah. And that's fairly insane to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, a sticking point too, and also that maybe it was unconscious but there just weren't any women anyway yeah. so what were you going to choose from it's just like well i'm just listening to men because i mean i know listening to hip-hop it's still you know in terms of the international um scene it's really still really hard to find really great women doing hip-hop and they are out there but you have to search like it's still skewed it's probably you know 10 percent of the scene so it's also about um an unconscious bias being there because like there's just nobody <laughs> nobody to actually listen to so that's where it needs to change as well it's just like we need the visibility so we can actually change it from the grassroots up it's difficult with like record labels and stuff so you know they can be the tough trot with that but what do you think that people in that situation both you know female and males that need that visibility what what would your advice be to them to help with that I think the biggest thing for me that I can see like immediate changes like on lineups is just being a little bit more conscious and you don't have to go, I don't think you have to go over the top where you're just like, like you said before, just putting women there for the sake of it, but actually broadening your the scope a little bit of what you're currently listening to and go, okay, what else is out there? Because there are incredible women out there. So it's not actually just... Um, the case you know you're just putting a woman there for the sake of it but there actually are incredible women that you can be also propping up so I think that's the f first and foremost for me it's very frustrating when I see lineups and it's just all dudes it's like you totally could have done better than that you know yeah and you don't want it to be at the same time you want them to be there not as placeholders yeah like exactly spot on yeah and like and that's like a lot of people say that yeah it's um it should only be the people that have the you know have earned their position or whatever but if you're not ever given an opportunity yeah. even to get a place like how do you how do you progress to the next level so someone's got to give you an opportunity to start it's a, you've now earned your place as such <laughs> in the australian media landscape as the go-to photographer essentially for a genre of music you're probably still one of a very few number of females operating in that space mm -hmm. so how do you feel you can assist others on the come up in the last, I would say, again, four years, I've seen the landscape of music photography really change. It's like, I used to be the only girl in the pit for years and years and years, and that has completely changed. And there's um, a Facebook group that was set up maybe, it's probably about a year ago, um, Girls in the Photo Pit, it's currently called. And there's over a hundred women in that group now that are just really supportive and really just you know if anyone has a question or you're just talking generally about gigs or sharing your work and getting feedback um and it's just such a really beautiful little um group of women that are just so positive and i believe i firmly believe right now that the most talented music photographers are women there was a australian music live music photography award um that was announced last week and um, a photographer in Sydney named Jess won that award. And it's really great to see that women are being regarded as some of the best uh, live music photographers in Australia. It's really, really encouraging and I'm here for it. <laughs> it's definitely interesting to see that. I mean, going to a lot of 
metal shows and hardcore shows, it's 100% that. Like, in that pit, I don't think there's any short supply of female photographers in there. Mm-hmm. Even if it's not safe for anyone. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. It's, they're putting their... Not only their bodies on the yeah. line, but their gear. Yeah, totally. But they're not afraid of it. Yeah. They're, not, they're in there, you know, and I'm sure it's not comfortable to be in there like, yeah. at all for anyone. And yet, they're probably, I'd say, at least with, like, punk and hardcore shows, they're the more prominent gender taking the photos. They're yeah. all there and yep. all that. And I've definitely, yeah, I would, I would totally agree. I think it's really balanced out over the last couple of years, and I'm really excited to see, like, The kids coming through now that are like, you know, between 17 and 20 are phenomenal. Like they are really talented and it just means that the standard of work for everybody has to increase because it really keeps you on your toes as well. It's like, it's great. I love, I love it. It's really nice to hear a person working in an industry where they could be dismissive of of younger talent because they could perceive them as a threat. Yeah, Um, I'm not about that at all. Yeah, I'm... I. Look, there's an, more than enough work, I think, for everyone. There's so many bands. Like, there's, there's enough work for us to go around. Um, I think it's really important that um, we uh, are a community that inspires each other. And I think it's specifically for women, too, because they can really suffer a lack of confidence between those ages. It's really important to nurture that talent and say, no, you do have something special. You could actually do this as a career. Um it's what I didn't have when I first started and it's like if you don't have that innate self-belief it's it's incredibly hard to keep going when nobody's telling you you know that you're good or whatever um so it's something that I'm really passionate about and uh just making sure that those women feel really loved and nurtured and that they you know they are talented I think that we've got as well I think the level of creativity in this day and age and the mixed media coming into it totally yeah and I think we're sort of in like the era of nostalgia as well. I'm seeing a lot of, you know, DIY zines coming in. Yep. You know, so not only are they taking these photos, but then they're like publishing them in a format that hasn't been prominent for oh, at least 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the same with film as well. So, like, you know, there's a big throwback to film at the moment. And, um, yeah, there's that love of that nostalgic stuff is obviously coming through a lot, which is really great because I feel like it's... Yeah, it's sparking a creativity in a younger generation that in these technologies that we're kind of forgotten about as well, which is kind of cool. These also age about gaps that shouldn't even really know about these. I know. Things, so well, I mean, I like a lot of these these kids. I'm you know nearly twenty years older, so it's like it's awesome to see that they're doing stuff that we kind of grew up with as kids as well. It's <laughs> it like wow, cool, that's it? cool. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, there was a there was a um, guy that we had on last week on our radio show that's doing his album on tape and i was like oh my god that is so cool (laughs) it is it is cool but it's also probably the one dead format i'm okay with letting go (laughs) (laughs) i'm here for the tape i'm here for the tape that's like the mini disc can probably the mini disc can go like (laughs) that was just problematic in terms of skipping and i just don't think it just it didn't work work properly (laughs) the um um, i had a discman it's like you couldn't really walk with it because it just (laughs) really bad yeah i had all that issues with mine like i deliberately bought a discman that could play mini discs yeah with as well as normal cds <laughs> and they actually brought out a thing that fit the mini disc inside, inside it the yeah yeah it's totally like, i remember that so as well there goes any points of having this thing yeah because it's still this big <laughs> it's like I mean, still massive i've then gone into collecting records because yeah well look i'm a hoarder and I think in this day of like digital music, yeah, it's too easy. I love going to like an op shop, finding something that I've been looking for, yeah, yeah, and getting that. You know? I've just started my record collection. Very old in my age, I, reckon, I probably started about a year ago, and I started just collecting my friends that were putting out vinyl or, or ones that I'd shot the cover for, and you know they've given me a copy or whatever, which is great. Um, so, and then now I've been. I'm starting to be giving them as gifts and stuff, which is really cool. Like my husband just bought me, um, when was it? it must have been my, my last birthday, maybe. Um, yeah, Kendrick Lamar, which the damn album on vinyl and like, yeah. So it's, it's starting. The collection is starting. But I was really devastated. My parents had a great record collection. I just thought that I was going to inherit it and they sold their house recently. And I was like, oh, hey, so can I have the vinyl collection? They're like, oh, no, we sold it. And I'm like... 
what do you mean you sold it? Like, yeah, yeah, I didn't think you'd want it. I was like, oh my God, they have like Michael Jackson and ABBA and David Bowie and all these like really cool records that I just assumed that I would get one day. And yeah, snooze, you lose, I guess. We might have to make a, a separate podcast which just talks about people getting into vinyl in their 30s. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be an ongoing trend. It's a trend. Oh, wow. Like, um, that's so funny. Host, so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, yeah. I'm not in my 30s yet. Yeah. And I've been... <laughs> Sorry. Was, yeah. Well, I'm in well into my 30s, so, so I was quite late. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I started probably about five years ago, and it's probably the most dangerous thing on my bank account. Yeah. And now that Afterpay is a thing. Oh, my God. Afterpay like, yeah. is the greatest and the worst thing <laughs> invention like, ever. Oh, guys. Yeah, but it's, you get it then. Yeah. I know, you but you get it, it, and yeah. then it's like, so it's... Yeah, it's more dangerous than lay-by. Because like, lay-by yeah. is like, oh, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. And then, you, have to, you know, you have to keep paying off to get it. This is like it's delivered to your yes. door like the next day. And then you kind of forget how many things you've ordered. And it's just micro-credit. <laughs> well, <it's> like, <laughs> yeah. like, I got, I used Afterpay totally. on the Black Panther soundtrack yeah. that Kendrick Lamar did. Amazing. And it was probably the smartest move that I ever did because of Black Friday. <laughs> oh, and it had everyone on it. That is such a great album, my God. This has actually led us back to a really interesting point because we're talking about what was formerly a dead format. Yeah. Um, you shoot predominantly digitally, correct? Yeah. Um, do you shoot analog at all? And if yes. you do, what makes the choice for you? Which, <laughs> which uh, I do. I've actually use? just started shooting it kind of this year or maybe last year. Yeah, but um, I guess not generally not for clients or very occasionally for clients. It's usually I'll be shooting and I'll just take a couple of frames within the shoot that I'm doing um, and then you get it back and, you know, you're like, oh, I should have taken way more. Occasionally I've taken a whole roll of film just for a client, but it's, um, it's pretty rare. Although the Camp Coat, all of their album stuff, so their their album cover and the stuff around that was all Polaroid, which is the first time I've ever shot Polaroid, and I was very nervous about it. That's such a Camp Coke thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was. Well, I think um, originally I think um, Ian Laidlaw was meant to shoot it, who's done a bunch of stuff for them, and he was away. He's a really good friend of mine. Um, and so, yeah, he was away, so they got me to shoot it, and I was really nervous about it because, like, Ian shoots that all the time and he's very, very good at it, and I was like, I cannot fuck this up. Um, and all my test shots were like not amazing either like because I hadn't used the polar I wasn't sure about the focus you have to be a certain um, you know meters away or whatever anyway it came out great and I was really <laughs> stoked with it so just one of those yeah nice synchronicities that happened which is good how do you decide what opportunities to take yeah I mean it's in a freelance world it's it can be tricky to get the balance and I think this year I really struggled to get that balance right where I was just too busy <laughs> just was so ridiculously busy where I was just saying yes to everything and um, one of my mentors gave me really good advice a few years back when I was in this same position like just run off my feet and so exhausted and he was like um, it's time to put your rates up when you get that busy, it's time to put your rates up and that will automatically, people will drop off and you'll get to a point where you're comfortable enough. And it might sound like well, weird advice, but it's probably the best advice that I've had. Um, and it, and any time I've got to that position, I've done the same thing. And then you get, to, you know, you progress again and then you get so busy that um, you have to do it again, which is really cool. But yeah, I guess there's not many things that I turn down unless it, it just goes against me ethically or, you know, it's a band that I just wouldn't work with for whatever reason. But that is pretty rare, to be honest. Like, um, yeah, most people I'm really stoked to be working with and I've had just such incredible opportunities, especially this year. It's been, a, you know, a, a really amazing year. Now, valuing your art in a financial sense um, is something that a lot of people usually struggle with. Um, yes, and they I know. And <laughs> don't tend to set their rates at an appropriate amount. Ever, yes. Let alone in a timely manner. They just never get there. Totally. Um, how did you manage to become accustomed to the concept that you're desired? Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Commodity, essentially. Yeah, that's such a good question. And this is another thing that I'm really passionate about teaching these young women coming through because uh, they're in the fact that there are these incredible photographers coming through, a lot of them are working for free. So they're really struggling with the transition to go from 
either shooting for a publication or just shooting for mates or whatever into making it a career and that it is a really tricky transition because you're afraid that when you say that it's going to cost a price you know whatever price that people are going to say okay no and it's changing the mindset about that it's like it actually doesn't matter if they say no you need to put a value on your art and say well you know if it's let's say a band is playing and they are at a venue and they have to pay a sound guy and they have to pay a lighting guy and they have to pay all the different fees that go around and you're another person that's there it's just you're just another person that needs to get paid for providing a service so trying to change the mentality around that when you're starting can be really tricky i have found from the minute that i put a value on my work the demand just tripled it was like the fact that i put value on myself and my work meant that other people saw the value in that and i have never had an issue and every time i put my rates up i get even busier again so it's like this really weird dichotomy that people struggle with in the art world but for me it's been the actual it's actually been putting that value on me that's been the best for my career. So you've heard it here, pay your photographers. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely pay your photographers. And it doesn't even matter at the start if it's $50. Like it's actually just paying for the fact that they're there, paying for their parking, for, you know, like it doesn't have to be like the amount that, you know, say I'm getting now. It doesn't have to be hundreds of dollars, but like start off with an, an amount that goes uh, your your time is respected your art is respected um and you know i'm you know appreciated appreciated that you're here so it's something that i'm really trying to educate so that there's just more opportunities because there's not many music photographers right now that are doing it as a full-time profession as just doing music photography like a lot of people have to subsidize it with weddings or corporate stuff like so I'd love there to be more opportunity like there is for myself where it's like 99.9% .9 of what I do is music photography and that's like essentially living the dream like it's just you know I, I get to do what I absolutely love every single day and I wake up going I absolutely love my life like it's just so fun I want more of that for lots of you know for other people as well it's amazing it's so good to hear that you didn't start till you were 31 and yeah I know this, uh, and you found so this. old I know I know and I've, I like yesterday like a lot of people were getting their their VCE results and I just tweeted like don't feel like you need to decide right now like it's and your results I got a shitty result like I I was this incredibly over overachiever as a kid that didn't apply themselves in year 12 and did really shit and I actually got into the course I wanted to anyway but it didn't really matter but I didn't get a great score but no one's ever asked me what my score is <laughs> like no one gives a shit other than that particular day and like trying to get into the university you want to get into but like progressing in life it really it really doesn't matter and you you know if you get into a uni course and then you don't like it it doesn't matter you can change I've changed careers like seven times it like it, you know you can find your path there's a path that you take for a reason usually and you, you know you can always find what you love and a way to get there like there's definitely a way to achieve whatever you really want in this world it can be through the back door it's fine <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like a tip for being a writer. I think it is yes <laughs> it is it is a tip <laughs> go, yeah. through the back door. go through the go back through door, the back door yeah. being a writer. now one thing I like to ask all the creatives that come in is about the past work, like the work they started out with. And yes. How they feel about it now. Oh my god. So to misquote a terrible band, <laughs> is there any photographs you look at and they just make you laugh? Yep. Yes. Recently, I had to go through some of my hard drive stuff because just my system was like overdrive like because I, I keep every photo I've ever taken so I was going back to 2011 which is like you know around about the first year that I was shooting and it's funny I've always had a quite a big confidence in my stuff like that I always liked it like which is actually kind of weird for a creative usually we hate our work and when I first started I was like oh this is pretty cool I'm, I'm all right at this and I'm looking at it now going this is the most horrendous shit I've ever seen in my life how did anyone hire me back then this is so bad <laughs> so I think it's um and I think we get that, like, I can look back even just a couple of years ago, or even Rise, like, I look through Rise now, and there's stuff in Rise that I'm really proud of, and there's stuff that I'm just like, oh, my God, that's terrible, which I think is, 
yeah, I think, it would, I mean, if you were looking back on a lot of stuff and loving all of it, I think you haven't progressed. So it's good that I feel like I'm still progressing. I'm still learning. I set challenges for myself every year. What do I want to learn in this year that's different? Um, whether that be like in the studio or just a, a technical thing that's different or, um, yeah. So, yeah, there's definitely a lot of shit that I just wouldn't want to show anybody anymore. <laughs> that's for sure. Do you find that really provides you with a sense of validation of your own growth as an artist? Yeah, too? totally. I mean, even, like I said, you can see the year by year growth, like, and, and with a project like Her Sound, Her Story, which was, that was 88 portraits over four years. And, you know, there's stuff in, in there as well that I'm really proud of. And, and a lot of that is because, you know, maybe I, I was allowed enough time or I had a really great connection with the artist. Sometimes you're only allowed five minutes, so you kind of work with what you can get. Um, and then some of those, that stuff I'm really proud of as well. It's like, wow, I got something really great and I literally had five minutes or I literally had, you know, two seconds or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great to look back at and, and see that growth, I think. Brilliant. There's that time pressure, that time sensitive nature of the live photographic industry in particular, uh, I find really interesting mm. in that you'll have acts, the bigger acts generally have a three song limit in the mm -hmm. photo pit. That's true. Do you find that the quality of work suffers because of that constraint or do you think that you get what you need out of those first three? Um, I don't think necessarily the quality and the only time I think the quality can really suffer is that, um, so for the first three songs, sometimes just the lighting can be really off. Yeah. Like that might be a, a mood thing that they're trying, you know, they're, they're going into the third or fourth or fifth song that that's when it really kind of ramps up. So you've just got just crap light to work with or it's funny. I've often thought that it should be the, th the three last songs. I think that would be the most brilliant thing to photograph. I don't know why it's the first three songs. It's that was a rule that came in many years ago. So I think that, yeah, if it was the last three songs, bands would get the most amazing photos from everyone. But anyway, that's not really yeah, a thing. We're missing out on the confetti. We're missing yeah, out on no, the like confetti. I know all of the cool stuff. I mean, sometimes like depending on the venue, sometimes you're allowed to like the three songs, you're allowed to stay in the venue. And so a lot of photographers will go up the back and wait for those kind of moments. But sometimes you're kicked out of the venue and you don't, don't get to see the rest of the gig, which is a bit rough in which, my opinion. I mean, reviewers get to see the rest of the show. Why don't you? You're reviewers, actually... reviewers get a plus one most of the time. So I'm like... And this is a thing that I've tweeted about before. <laughs> like, I'm on your side. Yes. I'm one of those reviewers, but I'm yes. on your side. I know. Yeah. I feel Give like... photographers a plus one. Yeah. And let them stay in I the let venue. them stay in the venue, especially for publications, because I don't think people are aware. Publications do not pay photographers. These photographers that you see in the pit, 90% of them are not being paid. A lot of them can't stay for the gig. They're not getting plus ones. Like... To be honest, I mean, it's incredible to me that there's so many people that are still willing to cover music, but there are. But I would, yeah, it'd be great if it was just opened up a little bit more. On the flip side, now that I've toured with artists and I do understand some of the frustrations with there being a lot of photographers and not all of them being the same quality and sometimes they're being very very terrible photos that are published i also can see the other side where i guess you want a bit of quality control so perhaps you don't want people shooting for the whole gig as well getting people to value a good photograph in an era when everybody in the pit and everybody in the stands and everybody standing around <laughs> or people that aren't even there have access to a high definition camera on their phone yeah must be a really strange and challenging dynamic to have to deal with yeah, it's really challenging. I think, um, look, I think people are pretty aware of an amazing photograph. And I think that the skill in music photography is, it's so much more than a technical skill. And I feel like that's why there's a lot of women that are actually really great at it, is that there is a feeling it's that goes, skill. it's an emotive skill. It's yeah. about picking a moment. It's about... Um, so many elements coming together outside just technical skill that... Um, people can see that in a photograph having said that there are a lot of just amateur photographers obviously not being paid so there can be a wide range of skill set and quality out there and i guess not everyone is aware of a good photo between a, a good photo and a, like a really great photo and maybe that comes with yeah a bit of time and knowledge and understanding but um yeah I, look some people there's a lot of photographers that have been around for a long time that I guess get frustrated with 
this new technology and, and having to keep up. I am the opposite. I'm inspired by it. It keeps me on my toes. And may I like I look at stuff and go, holy shit, I need to like keep my skills up because these kids are amazing. So like it's yeah for me it's inspiring. It's really cool. I think it's probably a good time for the rad break. It definitely <laughs> is. And I think it's also a good time to mention that our guest here is also a radio DJ. I am a radio <laughs> DJ. Well, kind of, yes. Um, <laughs> show us the hip-hop show. Yes. We're, we're um, kind of uh, well, the com- podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I get you. Show us the radio show. It's on KISS FM, is it not? It's on KISS FM on Wednesday nights at the moment, um, 8.30 till 10. We might be changing next year, but yes, we'll see. So, given your history as a photographer in the Australian hip-hop scene and also as a radio DJ, being yes. the voice for many of these artists getting their first crack at radio <laughs> airplay, I'm particularly interested to know who five Aussie hip hop artists are that people should be checking out right now. Right now, okay. And I wrote these down before, so hopefully I can remember them. Um, number one tip is a local artist named Kate, and it's spelled K A double I T. Um, she's been around for maybe a couple of years now, but she got a huge break this year when Jill Scott and Erica Badu. Um, made a post about her saying this is the, our Australian love child Whoa, and we saw her call. it was a huge call and but very true when you listen to her she's incredible she's only 19 um, she's making really beautiful kind of R&B hip-hop soul just awesome awesome stuff she's my number one tip yes number two who do I have on my list was Kwame. Cool. He's a young artist. He just won Triple J's whatever that award was, Breakthrough or whatever Unearthed or one of the Unearthed Awards. He had a great single this year called Wow that really blew me away just in terms of the production and just really unique sound when a lot of stuff can be kind of sounding the same in hip hop. So it's really, yeah, it's really cool. Oh, there's a group from Sydney called Triple One who just absolutely blew me away this year in terms of, again, just unique sound coming together in a collective, similar to, I guess, like how Brockhampton do. There's like a, there's a whole lot of people that are contributing to that sound, loving that, different again. Sophie Grophy is an incredible MC from Melbourne. She's amazing. I love this, her sound again, being really different, being female. Yeah, super impressed with her. And the fifth one I had was an artist who's been actually around for ages, but he put out a really good album. His name is B Wise. He's from Sydney as well. Really impressed with his progression over the last couple of years. And yeah, he put out a really great album this year. I saw him live open for Yellow Wolf. Ah, cool. He's really great. He's really great. He, He, interestingly enough, when I was doing Rise. He wasn't included in Rise. He was there and I saw I kind of, he was like about there and I was like considering it. And just after Rise happened, I saw a really big transition with him where I was like, this guy is like really stamping his authority. And in the last, yeah, kind of three or four years, just seen a really great progression and just stoked with everything he does. Yeah, super talented. Where can people go, not just in Melbourne, but Australia wide to, I guess, like uncover these hip-hop artists what venues are they playing at that's a good question i know locally there's there used to be a venue called grumpies i don't know if that they do a lot of grime stuff there um laundry bar does a lot of local especially they've been doing these girls to the front hip-hop night so they're just it's really cool they're having really great female artists there's um and djs as well um so those two i guess oh there's an uh Horse Bazaar do, um, there's a couple of events that they do. Um, They're probably the three most known to put on kind of hip hop nights as such. I'm not really sure about other states because I don't really, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure. That's okay. I mean, I I guess the thing people can do is just look up the artists you've mentioned. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, totally. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, this seems like a pretty good time to get back into discussion around her sound, her story, um, which I think might be one of the more powerful, or is definitely one of the more powerful pieces of uh, famil- filmography put together for around Australian music in many, many years. Thank you. Um, that's, I, I that's awesome. I think you chose a topic that 
is very relevant at the time in which it's been released, mm -hmm. um, but also which has a lot of, of room for depth and investigation, yeah. um, even beyond what's already been seen. Totally. How did you get the start on the project? <laughs> like, you're a photographer, not a photographer. I know, I one. know. I think, I, yeah, I kind of touched on it before about in terms of coming to the end of Rise and seeing there's this gender disparity in music and... I guess there's something in my personality too that like when I see a problem I want to fix it as yeah. well like what can I do to kind of so shine good. a light on this somehow it's something with my empathetic nature I'm like I want to like be a bit of a problem solver but then I guess through my art I'm able to visually tell a story or visually shine a light on a group of people so that's a, that the idea was just a photo series um, but once I started, I was like, ah, oh, no, this is, I just don't think a photo series is going to cut it. Like it is a bigger in-depth conversation. So that was when I asked my friend Claudia, who is an incredible filmmaker and she's does a lot of music videos. And I just kind of casually mentioned to her this idea and was like, hey, do you want to, when I'm shooting, do you want to just come along, tag along, we'll do some interviews, you know, maybe we'll make a documentary, but it was very throwaway. Like it was not a serious conversation and it also we didn't have any agenda like it wasn't like oh we're gonna go in and we're gonna we, this find this issue that we know that exists it was like it was actually kind of the opposite like Claudia and I had very you know very welcoming experiences in the music industry like we personally didn't feel this gender issue but I was like well, it definitely exists because there's just not that many women. So what is it about, you know, the gender that is not allowing as many to create music or the space or what is it? What What is what is happening, basically? So that's when we started this four-year-long journey into discovery. <laughs> Did you feel any pressure stepping outside of your usual artistic medium with this film? Not really, I guess. I mean, in terms of the actual creating of the film, in, from a technical point of view, that was that was Claudia's job. So she was she physically cut the film uh, and put it together in terms of a storytelling, and I was, um, I guess, producing essentially, and was obviously there for all the interviews. I didn't really feel a pressure other than needing to get it finished. Like that, I felt like we after speaking to so many incredible women and you know going back generations and people like Renee Geyer and Tina Arena and Kate Sobrano like when you're talking to that, that type of caliber of women you can't say that you're going to do a thing and then not do it so <laughs> that's where the pressure comes from really but like that for me those those types of pressures is what drives me like I'm incredibly accountable like if, if I say that I'm going to do something then I just have to do it so um, it's why if I tell people that I'm doing a project, I will do it because it just, people start asking me about the project. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I have to do that thing now. So and that was us with the podcast. Yeah. So it just, the gear so that we had to do it. They have to do it then. Um, you make it accountable to yourself then. Yeah, it's a good, good tip for creatives. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Put money into something so you've got something to lose. Yeah. <laughs> guarantees and then follow through. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, Yes. Yeah, I, and also too, like, so the film wasn't funded. That was the other thing is, like, it would have been very, I guess, easy to give up because it was so ridiculously hard. Like, it's very hard to put into words when you do 50 or 55 interviews, how many hours that is to go through and physically put into a 73-minute documentary. So um, there were many moments where both of us wanted to give up and I think the fact that we have a really solid friendship and we're there for each other through the highs and the lows and we're able to drag each other through to go you know we just need to get this finished was there any of the stories that you were told that struck particular chord with you or made you mm. realize that what you were doing was a worthwhile venture i think all of them in some way that was one thing like if we were ever low on energy or was like is this worth it we'd go do another interview and it would really spark oh yeah no this you know we have to do this like all of the women were so candid and so raw and honest with us and opened up in ways that they hadn't really in any other interviews before so I guess we really felt we we're in debt to them to be able to tell 
that story. But um, particular, I get, I think Akenyo for me, Akenyo probably hit me the hardest in terms of her little story, her story about being a little brown girl and not seeing herself represented on television and stuff like that is totally my story and not ever seeing anyone that looked like me in mainstream kind of television or, or not thinking that that sort of thing was possible or not thinking that that was beautiful or um yeah so that her particular story and she gets quite emotional and every time I watch it, and I've seen the film like I don't know probably a hundred times but it still gets me emotional um Mojo Juju's story is really you know again just that thing of not fitting in and that's definitely how I felt as a as a kid um yeah, there's. I mean, there's so many, but those two in particular definitely stand out. We really want to get Mojo Juju on this podcast. I've been thinking about it. All Totes. Well, I can hook you up. That'd She's great. Cool. <laughs> yeah. She's great. I'm particularly curious as to how you reacted to the critical acclaim that's been thrown the way of the yeah. film. I've never seen a bad thing said. <laughs> that's so funny that you say that because there hasn't been so. Okay. I was fully preparing myself there to be some pretty severe blowback because of, I guess, the time that we're in. Um, it's tricky to get a film covering all of, I guess, representation of all of the areas in, in music. And like, that was one thing I was, well, both of us were incredibly passionate about was representation of all the different groups, whether that be from, um, an ethnicity point of view or a sexuality point of view or um, just, yeah, we just really wanted to get the, the broadest landscape or genre, you know, like it just, we really wanted it to show all of the spectrums of music because I just didn't want us to be left open to criticism. Like you left out this particular group, like that just wasn't in the nature of what we were trying to do. It really was trying to be a really inclusive documentary. So having said that, I was still very prepared for us, like to, to something that we'd missed or, um, and I'm really, I'm quite connected on social media. So I was waiting for something to happen. It and always happens. It always happens. And like, I mean, not to say that it still couldn't happen, but um, the only negative thing that I've ever seen post was when we posted the trailer before the documentary came out, we posted a one minute trailer and this guy <laughs> wrote on our Vimeo, um, like the comment section, it was like a pages <laughs> of what, how he thought the documentary was wrong and that, you know, there's no issue in music and it's all to do with, you know, it's, you know, it's all merit based and blah, blah, blah. And, and then he's like, and I don't know why you decided to end on such a high because it's such a negative documentary. This is after watching a minute. <laughs> I was like, wow, you just, uh, I don't even know how to reply to that. So, with, yeah, I just um, thought that was kind of amusing that someone would be so emotionally invested and have such an opinion about something they'd literally seen a minute trailer of. <laughs> and I think you, you learned something firsthand that, everyone including musicians would know more than anything and probably should be a tip for being a rat adult never read the comments <laughs> never read the co video. well unfortunately it was the only comments <laughs> oh, <laughs> and it went for pages so i was like i can't really ignore it it was like literally this long like okay so, it's like so often you hear about don't read the comments yeah. on youtube were you <laughs> hoping to inspire others when doing her sound her story like, yeah what were you aiming to achieve with that yeah, I know when Claudia cut it, she was really, there was a few people she was kind of thinking about in her mind. One of them was definitely younger women, you know, school age girls watching this to go, okay, yes, there are these things that we're all going to suffer, but these are the women that are actually just kicking ass still. Like these, you know, there's Missy Higgins and there's Julia Stone and like some of the most successful women still face these hurdles, but they prevail. So I think that's a really inspiring message. Um, we're definitely hoping to inspire men that see it to, to just to have a little bit of empathy and understanding, um, not to feel attacked or not to feel defensive, just to be like, okay, cool. We can see why it's a little bit different. Don't need to feel bad about that. 
just need to be more aware, I think. So I think those two things um, were in the back of our mind always to hopefully, um, yeah, inspire some type of change within the industry. And these, these are micro things, you know, these are just when dealing on a day-to-day basis, just being a little bit more aware, I think. Yeah. And how have men taken the film? So incredibly positive. We've had, I think, probably the most beautiful responses for some, yeah, from incredible men like some really close friends of mine that have seen it have um, sent me messages that have just completely blown me away um, wanting to actually wanting to change like there's a friend of mine who's in a very very famous band in the kind of hardcore metal scene who wrote me this beautiful email just saying I knew it was bad I had no idea it was this bad and like what can I do to help and that's been like the common theme really is this wanting wanting to make a difference and um which is great because we just didn't we just didn't want men to feel like they were attacked this is not about making any men feel bad or or attacked or defensive it really is about awareness and just yeah loving everyone loving each other a little bit more to help through these times are just like yeah that's that's a bit shit let's support each other and when you see something happen or you somebody said something really crap or whatever i think it's one of the pieces of us been giving people recently the most is to actually see the film that are from the world i'm from right i'm a cis white male musician Mm -hmm. me too right (laughs) um i but the scene i associate myself with covers such a diverse array of um of backgrounds and and identities and orientations and the men in the scene at times feel attacked it seems Mm -hmm. at the moment yep and i think it's because of the way that a lot of the messages are presented to them and i really think this film is an opportunity for them to see it and have it sink in in a way that's not as attacking Totally, um, and, and I attack yeah. the ego, which yes. is the main issue with t- speaking to any human generally. Yeah, and we I can, can be under- sensitive. <laughs> yes, and I can understand that, and I can understand why men do feel attacked right now in terms of like the language that's used. And you just said you're a cis white male. I've seen that, and yeah, we've all seen that um, posted a million times. I yeah. just and that that's frustrating to me as well. I don't really feel that that's helpful. Um, I understand why it's been pointed out and I totally understand the privilege that comes along with that and that is definitely a thing. Whether that needs to be reminded every single time someone has an opinion, I don't necessarily feel like that's the right way of everybody moving forward. Claudia and I were both very conscious of that as well because there's been a lot of men in our lives that have been incredibly positive, incredibly encouraging and don't fit that box of you know wanting to squash women at all so we're both you know also very aware of that we don't want to alienate those people that um have been incredible allies to us so it's um it's i I mean we don't feel like it's pandering Uh, we feel like it is speaking a language that is inclusive and it's it it can appeal to a human sensitivity and an empathy and I think that's what it's all about to humanize people and go this is this is why it's a bit shit not it's because you're a cis white white male that you don't get it it's like no we're all human beings and this is why it's a little bit shit for us and can you understand that and let's try and make move forward it needs to get to a point where not only you know is it universally understood Mm -hmm. and people get it but then like we've just mentioned because you know we don't discriminate we again shouldn't have to go but wait we're white yeah and we're straight and we're male you know yeah it needs to get to a point where we shouldn't say that before an opinion yep totally be like you know what if we haven't discriminated we shouldn't also defend ourselves by saying that it's yeah like going, oh i know what you mean but one of the biggest things that i've done in the last year to kind of evolve as a human is actually go and listen to podcasts for hours of people that i don't agree with I listen to them and challenge my own views and go, right, or listen to someone that I've heard is whatever and go and form my own opinion. And it's really started to challenge my own belief system to go, oh, and just be like, oh, hang on. Okay, 
fifty percent of that that person I don't agree with. Some of the other stuff I'm like, oh yeah, that's kind of fair enough. And also understand that humans are not black and white. There's so much grey, and we just we have um, we have more to offer than just like one sentence that you said, you know, or that you know the, this bad thing that you said once seven years ago. Yeah. I feel like we need to evolve as people to understand that we are complex human beings we all have differing opinions on things but we can actually all still get along it's okay we don't have to put each other's in boxes of you are a bad person i am an amazing person like it's i think it's very counterproductive we all exist somewhere in the middle of that we totally do all of us on a daily basis we're probably very absolutely yeah. yeah and the internet and the media I think takes away a lot of context. Absolutely. It's all said. about just headlines. Yeah. Of like one thing, that crazy thing that Kanye said or whatever. You yeah. know, Kanye's probably a bad example. He said yeah, some pretty cheap I mean, things. Look, <laughs> <laughs> I love Kanye, so it's like, you know, I will defend him until I die. But having said that, he has said some pretty shit things music. lately. <laughs> I love his music. I hate his shoes. <laughs> And I hate his most of his out. But his mute and that's the hard to sort of split it. I go, I love the music he does. Yeah. And at least personally for me, like it will never get better than Watch the Throne. Yeah, right. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting that that's the one that you go to. Cool. It's a great album, but yeah. And I love my bitch with Darkest Defense. Yeah, same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> genius, own, absolute I, genius. I own both on record. Yeah. So I've got that. Oh, but at the same time, like and again, I'm going based on what the internet's told me. He doesn't seem like someone I'd want to meet. So that's so interesting because I, like, when he does these rants or whatever and they've picked out these three, like, crazy things that he said, I'll go and I'll listen to the 45 minutes that he was dribbling on. And I'm like, I think I understand what he's trying to say. He's really poor articulation. Oh. And he gets on these, like, very, he, yeah, these kind of manic, like, I don't know. He just, and he just said some crazy shit. Having said that, I do feel like there's some good shit in there. He's he's coming from a place of love. It's just not very well articulated. Yeah. And, so. and then I wonder, like, what he's like <laughs> as far as how he composes things as well. Because, I mean, I've seen him be on, like, the show with Sway. Yes. Doing the freestyle. Yeah. And sort of get stuck. Yeah. Stuck. And then you've got people like Childish Gambino and, like, Tyler, the creator and stuff like that, doing these things where, look, maybe they've planned it. Yeah. And they've said it. And you're like, whoa. Yeah, like, totally. I mean, there's a... Di- there gets stuck. There's a there's different... That's a different skill set as well. Yeah. Like, if you're talking about freestyling, there's just people that are just, like, off the, te- off the top of the head. Genius. And then there's people that are not. They need to actually go away and write stuff and be a little bit more prepared. It's like, for me... Yeah, bit of a different skill. Hip hop has a bit of a political leaning to it at times. I think it really should more often than it does. Yeah. Um, in Australia, I think Briggs is a very good example of somebody who pushes his political viewpoints to mm-hmm. the forefront quite frequently. Yeah. Do you think he'd make a good prime minister? Oh my god, yes, absolutely. Vote. Oh no, hundred um, percent. As someone, I've known Briggs since he was four years old, and I've seen um, the progression of a young, annoying boy that would hang around me and his sister who I was best friends with and just annoy the shit out of us into um this incredible man that's just like was not only a leader for his local community but for the extended um indigenous kind of population and yeah I just am so proud of everything that he's achieved and have only great words to say about Briggs. He's awesome. And, he's and he got me into the Virgin Lounge the other day when I couldn't get in and because he is a Platinum of Virgin member. It and makes me so happy that he's a Platinum Virgin member. It made me so happy. He was, I was like, how many guests can he get? He's like, I think four or five. I was like, sweet. And <laughs> but his, yeah. His current handle's like Senator Briggs. Senator Briggs, yes. Yeah, this is where I like Angle Panther. Yeah. yeah. Yes. He's, he's amazing. I, like I said, I only have, and, and like, to be honest, um, almost single-handedly responsible for my career in music and has put me on a couple of times not only he's the first gig i ever shot was him 
supporting the Hilltop Hoods. Brilliant. So big really first big show. first show. Um, I did actually get dragged off stage and kicked out of the venue that show, which That's was also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I got back in, but it was very like a very strange first experience, but um, also gave me the bug of, of doing what I do. Also, he introduced me to Pharaoh Monch, which was the first pretty major international album cover that I ever shot was for Pharaoh Monch. So, um, yeah, there's been a couple of moments in time where he's really stepped up and, um, yeah, forever grateful. Awesome. Another thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You've taken tens of thousands of photos. So many. No doubt more. Oh, my God, I don't even know. Right. Tens of thousands are just on one tour. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I've um, loved 11, 11 so years. what still excites years. you about getting behind the camera? Oh, God. Um, okay. So this is why I'm passionate about the medium of photography is that there's something in freezing a moment of time that will never be again that I can't really explain of what I'm drawn to or it's just I think it's the most incredible art form and when it's done right is timeless. And so that is what drives me every single day and every time I shoot is to find the one moment in the show or the one moment that's backstage that is timeless and that somebody can look back on and, and, and feel an emotion in that photo. And it's just, it's why I'm not drawn to video and it's, and, and it's just, yeah, just I love it so much. <laughs> I have to ask this question. Uh, I don't care if this runs on, but what does it feel like to know that like two of your portrait series have a permanent presence for eternity? I like how you put that for eternity in there, in the National Sound and Film Archive of Australia. Oh God, I know when um, when I got the phone call f about Rise, um, I ha I didn't know what the National Sound and Film Archive oh, was. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to I I messaged a mentor of mine I was like hey I got this phone call what is this and he's like okay this is really good this is a big deal and he was like basically this means that when you die people can be you know see your work forever and I I I yeah I don't mean I've got no words for that it's just you know like uh, if, as an artist, I feel like I can die happy. Like, you know, that in a hundred or thousand years' time, people are going to know of my art at this moment of time and they can look back on it and go, you know. When the aliens come when to Australia the alien and exactly. they come looking to get an understanding of the culture, your work is going to help inform them of the power of a musical genre. So exactly. They make the totally. a better place there. Well, yeah. And, like, I mean, specifically for Rise, because that was... I guess a moment in time for hip hop, but also for her sound her story. It's like there's there's 88 women of like all these different backgrounds, and um, yeah, there's all these incredible women that people can look back and go, "This is a snapshot of what women in music look like," you know, in this particular time. So I'm very proud of that. We really are very thankful for your presence on our <laughs> podcast. It's been amazing. I could talk to you for hours because your passion for photography is very similar to my level of passion for music and the creation of music and the performance of live music cool. which I have and will talk to people about yes. for hours upon end I think I have that as well to be honest like I feel like um, it's why I like to be um, backstage for example yeah. like that I'm, I never take for granted that I'm allowed in such a space that is like you know that's in a sanctum you know like there's only a few people that get to witness like pre-show prep or um, the nerves that occur or any of that sort of thing and also similarly if I'm ever allowed into a studio where there's music created and I have been in the studio when really special stuff has been created and that is such a privilege so I, I also have that that same passion awesome so <laughs> following on from that what's next yeah that's that's the question that I'm like despising at the moment. <laughs> it's yeah. so funny. Sorry. Um, holiday. No. <laughs> holiday. Usually, when this is the holiday. Case, holiday it is yeah. actually, I'm actually really, um, I'm going to have a couple of weeks off, which is very rare for me. I haven't had a couple of weeks off for a while where I've just, I just need to switch off for a bit. And um, I don't know exactly what's next, but. The increase of rates. The increase of rates is 100%. <laughs> one of the things that will happen. Yep. 
Okay, so for the people listening to this, where can they find your stuff on social media and online? Yep, so um, on Instagram and Twitter, actually. It's just Michelle G. Hunder, H-U-N-D-E-R. And I'm just, I think I'm Facebook Michelle Grace Hunder Photography, I think, but you can find find me through. And michellegracehunder.com is my website. Yeah. And it's a very nice website. Uh, it is. Thanks. I'm very proud of my you website, have actually. the best written bio I've read of any of the people so Oh, far. really? So it, I... told, it tells the story. So if you want to know, apart oh, from listening to this podcast, cool. if you want to know exactly what this marvellous woman has achieved in her career so far, go read this. 300 word bio that tells you everything you that's can cool because i hate bios like i think they're so lame and i'm like i really i've had like a few people do yeah write them and i've kind of meshed them together and yeah that's that's good feedback because i find them quite cringy <laughs> oh, that's, that's amazing now uh yeah are you gonna what are you gonna get me to sing or something i feel like you're prepping me for something oh, here can you? <laughs> no <laughs> i'm definitely not gonna freestyle? see definitely not i cannot can freestyle no the there's no bars. <laughs> the only thing left to do uh-huh. is to ask you if you have any more tips for being a rattled yes um the biggest tip that i have is to find Find the thing that drives, like, that, that you have the most love for and the, the passion that you keep coming to. And if you can make that into your career, you will lead such an amazing life. So that's what I was able to do. And I absolutely, without a doubt, have the most incredible life. And I feel so privileged to do what I do. So if you're able to do that with a hobby or something that you love to do every day, then you'd be pretty rad, I reckon. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> no worries. My uh, pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Be sure to have paid photographers at your show. <laughs> paid uh, photographers. Don't kick any reviewers or photographers out of the show. Yeah. Don't do yeah, that. Don't do- if you are a wh- white man <laughs> or a man at all. Stop saying that you're a man or white. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> feeling threatened by the current state of affairs. Go see her sound, her story. Go say, oh, yes, yeah, so I should say that. Her sound, her story dot com. You can find out where our next screen- um, screenings are coming up and we will be online soon. So. And you should probably have a listen to Briggs. Listen to Briggs, and definitely. the other artists that have been mentioned. Yes. We can't say that. So we include everyone there. Yeah. We'll chuck up a link with some of the artists listed. Yeah, I can send you some um, links for sure. And then we'll go from there. Yep. But thanks for joining us for another episode. If you we can are... do us a favour and give us a five-star rating on iTunes, if you're listening on iTunes, yes. that would be amazing. Um, that helps us turn up in the new and noteworthy section. That's somewhere we want to be because the story is one that needs to be heard by as many people as possible. And we're new and not yet noteworthy. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining us. Catch you later.